In this second part of the Consciously Hybrid series, we continue to explore South Africa's relationship with cloud technologies. In particular, the public sector. My name is Daniel. I travel the world discovering how cloud technologies are destined to shape the way we live and work. In this episode, we're discovering some of the concerns associated with moving to the cloud and addressing some of the confusion of where and how data should exist. Make the choices and make those choices deliberately. There was a certain amount of nervousness that the risk committee would not understand. So we've taken the approach of saying that uh, departments and agencies should understand their data, should classify their data, and should understand which, what data is being moved into the cloud. They should further understand where in the cloud. I think the question of where, you know, the cloud sometimes is, is just seen as a single entity and we understand that, that uh, typically you have a multinational organization, as you indicate, with uh, different presences across the, across the globe. And so your data could, you could find your data on a particular application or a particular uh, service being scattered across the globe. So we, we say to departments, understand where your, depart where your data will be uh, uh, hosted. Uh, understand this and, and classify the sensitive, the, the, your data around its sensitivity. And we indicate in the directive that sensitive data should not be stored in the cloud, in the public cloud in general. So make the decision for yourself. Uh, but once you've decided what is sensitive to you as an organization, or as a department, make sure that sensitive data is not stored in the public cloud. And that's why we've, we've defined the government private cloud and we give the responsibility to the state IT agency to develop the systems and, and, and the technologies and the private cloud uh, technologies to be able to provide these services for government data. Data sovereignty is massively important for any government department and myself as a client specialist, I effectively work for that government department and I need to be able to protect their interests and in doing so, need to be able to take the, that into account. On the other flip side of it, I need to also look at it as a personal citizen as well, about my data being really protected overall. And it is important. I think from a data sovereignty side, we've got the advantage that a lot of the public cloud providers within South Africa have got local data centers and regions so we can get a lot of those type of services within South Africa. But that is not a total definitive answer. Uh, what we found in recent months is that although we have enlisted the services of various cloud providers, um, the guarantees provided was that your data is resident locally. And when you start digging a bit deeper, uh, you'll find one of your components actually being hosted outside of the country, which obviously contradicts and goes against the um, agreements that we had. And that, I think, is probably still a background conversation for many, saying that, well, we're saying that our data is locally resident. Uh, however, it's been proven that it's not always the case. And therefore, the question around, well, should I rather retain my data uh, on-premise and perhaps have processing power in the cloud, which still comes down to hybrid, uh, that may become one of the outcomes that we're looking for. You might have a particular commercial software as a service offering that you can get from one of the public cloud providers with inside their region in South Africa. And you might think that all your data is actually protected locally, but that's not a reality either because there's so many, uh, how can I say it, hooks into that particular data or services that are necessary to be able to provide that service to the, the client sitting in that public cloud that might sit outside that, that region. So at the end of the day, it's not a full, fully protected um, type of service as well that, that comes out of a local public cloud uh, data center. I, th I think that's quite, quite interesting to be able to actually see that. And when looking at a lot of these offerings that the public cloud providers might provide, 
that is something that needs to be able to be taken into account. But again, it really goes down to the data policies at a government level and understanding which data needs to be able to be protected at, the, at that level. So what data is actually going out there? I mean, are they important files? Um, and there are many, many pockets of data that might sit in databases or whatever they might be. And they might be sitting at site levels, they might be sitting on people's laptops, um, they could be sitting in data centers. And ultimately, we need to be able to understand where, where all that data resides, not only from a sovereignty or a security perspective, but also to be able to utilize that data as well for, for further interrogation, intelligence as well, to be able to actually get the use out of that data, which would be fantastic. We do have a number of localized data centers, which have been provided by a number of providers um, available within the market. Uh, so the question would then arise is that, do we just partner with these rather than trying to create this entire competency on our own? And uh, with that, have the legislation adapted to say that, well, if you are utilizing a data center from whichever provider it may be, these are the constraints and the conditions under which it should be run. And whether it is a partnership agreement between our state uh, information technology agency and the actual provider, um, that would probably give us a lot more leverage than trying to build this on our own and then expect it to have the best outcome. And I think it also reduces the risk that is associated to it. I think it's one of those things, mountains and molehills, right? Uh, absolutely, the geopolitics is a reality. Uh, but like anything my mom used to say, you have to choose your friends, right? And the fundamental thing in a digital context, you can't do everything yourself. You have to rely on partners. Choose your partners wisely, like you choose your friends. There, are, there is certain data because of the competitiveness of the world that we have to appreciate. Once again, what's my diamonds and what's my paper clips? I'm not going to, I'm not going to go and fight a ridiculous negotiation costing millions of rands about a paperclip. I will definitely do that about my diamonds. So the ability once again to understand, to take a value risk-based approach to data, right? And I, but I also think that while people think that data is abstract, I don't think it is abstract. When you understand the value of your data, I think it was the IDC that said that any organization, just by utilizing the data that's in their organization, so not no external data, can add between 35 and 38% to their bottom line. And, and I said organization, right? So that includes government because of this concept around, around economic activity and thinking about e economic activity. Um, but like anything, uh, zero trust uh, in a technology sense. Uh, and then, and then, understanding who you trust. And I think trust becomes uh, an important commodity, in a, uh, com commodity. So in a technology sense, when I think about trust, I think about security. I think about privacy and control. I think about availability. Uh, and I think about uh, the ability uh, from a standards point of view, choose your standards and choose them well. Because if I choose the right standards, I can then forego having to think about elements of interoperability because of working off a, a similar standard. So it, it's once again, make the choices and make those choices deliberately. And like Napoleon, measure twice, cut once. Plan, 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 and then execute, execute on the plan. We've not closed the door in terms of data being uh, uh, hosted outside of the borders. What we do say, is that there is a, a Poppy Act in South Africa that gives specific guidance and sets the, 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 uh, uh, the, the laws and the rules around when and how data is stored outside of the country. And so we've, we've, I, I believe that we've given sufficient guidance to departments in the directive to be able to deal with this issue of sovereign, sovereignty, uh, to make sure that we as a country can, can uh, secure our citizen data and make sure that as we utilize the services, as we utilize the technologies, we are also responsible. Data sovereignty and perhaps even the sovereignty of digital infrastructure is being debated the world over. The security 
classification and economic opportunities are clearly front of mind as South Africa takes its place in the digital economy. When it comes to cloud technology, the possibilities are endless and understanding the art of the possible is probably a full-time job. But being aware of the challenges is as equally as important. The question here is not whether or not we adopt cloud. It is we do adopt cloud. It brings capabilities. It's how we do it and over what period of time and how much risk we are willing to uh, or we are willing and able to absorb. I suppose that the first thing uh, uh, is an, a clear, not, not, not enough, not too much depth, is an understanding of this environment in order to assess the overall risk. And I'm not talking about 100,000 points of risk, maybe five points of risk, right? Uh, but you have to have a, a bit of breadth and a fairly good depth to know what is a lemon and what is not a lemon to know what is true and what is not true, a bit of imagination to know what is possible and what is not possible. I found in our discussions post the publication of the directive was that departments and agencies seem to believe that we are the gatekeepers and that they need to come to the DPSA and ask us for permission to utilize cloud and certainly that's not the case. Uh, a, a department owns the data. You own your data as a department and so you have to decide how you want to store that data, how you want to process that data, how you want to digitize that data. We say to departments that make your decisions following the guidelines that we've set out in the directive. Make sure that you, you, you deal with your, the committees that have been set out in the directive. So we, for instance, say that you must go to your risk management committee as an organization, as a department, and be able to show that you've taken into consideration issues of IT risk, issues of data risk, issues of, of uh, location of your information, uh, issues of skills, and et cetera, et cetera. We've uh, asked departments to present their business cases to their risk management committees and make sure that they are approved by their accounting officers and by their excos, et cetera, et cetera, before they start to consume the cloud. And I think this is the, this is the big change in mindset that we want to see in our departments. So when it comes to hybrid, um, I think the important thing to understand is that depending on, so, so the one question would always come about, would be a conversation with your CFO, where the CFO says, well, we spent millions on investing in infrastructure, and now you're telling me two years later, well, guess what, you don't need this any longer, I'm gonna move it to the cloud. And obviously, then comes the question on return on investment. So why do we buy this particular equipment if you're only gonna use it, not using it until the end of life? Which may also determine as to whether or not you're gonna be going full cloud or hybrid. And I think with that said, and also across our SOCs, is um, we have a couple of enterprises. They are a very big organization. There is potentially a need where the data centers that is being run by ESCOM is fairly large because they have uh, a number of different services and systems that have been hosted on the physical infrastructure. And to then say, well, lift and shift this into the cloud purely may be of a greater risk than uh, saying, well, let's do the hybrid in which we say, well, take basic services and move them to a cloud environment. If we were to use an example, is uh, taking your exchange online versus having it on-prem. May make a lot more sense to have that 24 seven availability. Um, you know, within our, our current state that we find ourselves in, um, we have this, um, well, we call it the new norm, the uh, load shedding schedule. So you have to work yourself around that process. And uh, as much as a lot of investment has now been made into backup power supplies, you may find that it may not be as impactful and it may not provide the necessary backup that you require. So therefore having a hybrid environment may become a lot more critical than having a pure shift uh, towards cloud. Um, in the organizations that I've been uh, between DSBD and DPE, uh, in actual fact, um, with DSBD as an example, we literally moved uh, our core services, which includes our email um, as, as one service, our SharePoint environment as well, into the cloud. And um, the irony is that where some of the departments, when we are hit by an outage, be it power outage or network outage, um, my end users in those environments had no clue that we were actually offline, or rather other departments were offline, because we transitioned to that point. When you move into these hyperscale environments, there are net new costs that you never ever thought about. So as an example, if you put a workload into the public cloud and put it into separate regions, there is an unintended cost and the 
unintended cost is to move data between regions incurs a cost called egress, the charging you to move data between regions. And that's a cost that many customers didn't uh, factor into the design of when uh, they went into these public clouds. Because again, the thinking was a, an analog thinking in a digital world, if I can use that, uh, that term uh, respectfully. Whenever there's a problem, there's a businessman behind that problem. <laughs> because there's some businessman who knows he's going to lose out. All right? Uh, for example, there are people who prefer to have hardware-based transactions. You know, they, their business thrive on that. If I don't have hardware, they, don't, they get out of data center business, they get out of the diesel business, they get out of the battery space business, and so many other businesses that are dependent on that one transaction of me having a infrastructure on-prem, yeah? But there are those who thrive on consulting, who actually makes the initiative to transition us from one to another. So to, to, from on-prem to cloud, for example, uh, those consultants who are in that space, they thrive in that kind of environment. The business case for me to talk about cloud, what are the selling points? Is it about cost reduction? Is it about the skills limitation that is forcing me to go because I'm now less involved? Somebody is going to take care of my environment. I'm part of the government structure of GTOC, which is the CIO's structure. We have always then been talking that as and when we think of moving into cloud, we need to make sure that we get, as I said, trusted partners. And for me then, it, it actually motivated me to start looking at a hybrid model. So during, I think, my seventh year journey, that's when, as part of listening to business where it wants to go in terms of interfacing with others, I saw it fit that we need now to start looking at a smart way of implementing certain solution. And the journey of now having a hybrid started on my year seven, as I said. What that then requires is for institutions such as ours to really invest a significant amount of time in really understanding the challenges uh, of the day and the, as well as the aspirations of the future and really look at the data that is uh, before us and look at what the data tells us and then empower ourselves in terms of some of the innovative ideas that we can bring to bear in really challenging the status quo within public sector number one as well as articulating the, the, the art of the possible, right? Based on the data, what is that what are the possibilities that can be achieved in the future? And I, I believe with the data first approach or the data first modernization that really speaks to the challenges, how we address the challenges, as well as the outcome that can be achieved, not just for public sector, but for the citizens. There was a certain amount of nervousness that the risk committee would not understand and would, be, uh, would decline the, the request to utilize the cloud just because of misconceptions around issues of cloud and safety and all of those kinds of things. And so we had to reassure those risk committee members that one, the directive was proper and that what was being done and what was being proposed for that department was aligned to what we had indicated in the cloud. And I think uh, we have to do a better job as the DPSA to make sure that we communicate outside of our uh, comfort zone. Now, our comfort zone is typically with the technologists. You know, we speak to them all the time as we develop our prescripts. We speak to them after we've published them. Uh, but we need to start to talk to uh, the end user a lot more. And we're starting to do that as a, as a strategy, as approach uh, in the DPSA. We, uh, we have now taken the approach that we will go to provinces collectively with our counterparts in human resources and our counterparts in service delivery. And we'll have one conversation around service delivery improvement. And we'll try to make sure that we're not talking about the technology, but we're talking about how the services will be improved. And so that's our challenge, uh, both from a cloud adoption perspective, but also in terms of our other policies. There are clearly some complex challenges to consider. South Africa is embracing its cloud directive. And I heard consistently how technologists take this responsibility very seriously. Finding trusted partners and discovering solutions together is clearly accelerating change. Cloud is no longer a destination, but a method for solving challenges. 
I believe this will undoubtedly be key to unlocking data and transforming government services. This conscious and considered approach is clearly a shared mission across the nation. The reality is that business strategy could change in the next two to three years. The comfort zone that we're in has come to an end. I, I can't see a, a scenario where we are totally reliant on cloud technologies. The important thing is not to take the total capacity at a go. You take it as you need that capacity. Mm -hmm.